Okay, we are live. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome, my name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids. I'm really excited to be kicking off the new year with our first Google Hangout here at the Bimini Shark Lab. Uh, so we're on the island of Bimini in the Bahamas. It's about 50 miles from Florida. And the research station was built in 1990 by Doc Gruber as a base for his work with lemon sharks. But now they study all different species. And uh, today we're going to meet the team um, from the lab, our special guest, uh, and talk a little bit about shark anatomy, some of the tools that scientists use to study sharks, and then actually see a scientific workup, which is the data collection process that scientists do all over the world when they actually catch sharks things that they want to know about each animal. So I'm going to go ahead and let the team introduce themselves as we get started. Hi guys, my name is Chessie. I'm from London, England. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Bimini Shark Lab. And my job is to basically be involved with the community and to help uh, uh, the public uh, learn about sharks here uh, through tools, through research experiences. And I'm really excited to be here with Gillian and Sharks for Kids today talking about uh, shark science, and hopefully you guys will enjoy some and see some live shark science in action. Hey guys, I'm Sarah, and I'm from Texas, and I am one of the volunteers here at the Bimini Shark Club. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm also a volunteer from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we're going to start talking about sharks with you guys. Cool. All right. So uh, we're going to go ahead and introduce our classes. So first up, we have Miss Silvers, grade 11 class, joining us all the way from France. You guys want to say hi? Here, I can unmute your microphone for you guys so you can say hello. So Miss Silvers, class, have you? Oh, no, it's not. Do so you just want to go ahead and hit that microphone up at the top? Cool. Yeah. All right. Hi. All right. So let's go ahead and we'll introduce um, Mrs. Harmon's kindergarten class. You guys want to say hi? Hi. That's great. I love it when everyone's excited to talk about sharks. We are too. Yeah. All right, and this is Garlock's grade four. Hi. And then we have Mrs. Slice, grade two, three. All right. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. All right. So. Mentioned that we're here um, in Bimini at the Shark Lab. Head in. So we are at the Shark Lab, and out behind the, the building, um, the ocean's right out back, and there are pens, uh, which if you think of like where sheep or horses, cows out in the field, and there's a fence around. The lab actually has kind of like an ocean fence, and it'll actually have juvenile lemon and nurse sharks. So small sharks in there uh, for about 30 days or less, and they're in there so that um, people coming to visit the lab, uh, the general public come, visiting scientists, they can see and learn a little bit about these animals. Um, but also when the volunteers show up, they learn how to safely handle these sharks so that when they're tagging and they're out on boats, uh, and then the shark's released into the exact spot it was captured. Um, so it's kind of like a little holiday for them. They get to have a nice place to chill out, get some food. Uh, but they're only there for a short amount of time, and then they're released. So with us today, we do have one of those sharks. Um, it's a special guest. I'm going to just come around the side. Get our friend here. I'll just move over. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to show you guys real close. All right, this is our special friend, the nurse shark. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things you may notice that look very different um, than what you're thinking a shark should look like. So the first thing we're going to go through is talk about the anatomy and some of the features that this shark has that you're probably all going, wait a minute, that looks more like a catfish, or definitely not like a shark. So we'll go ahead and get started with that, talk about some of the equipment that we actually use to sort of study these animals, and then again, finish up with a scientific workup, which is collecting data about the sharks, and it's what scientists use all over the world to get specific information about each animal they're working with. 
All right. Got a bit blurry. Hi, everyone again. I'm Elizabeth, and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about anatomy. Um, the anatomy of the shark is really important and can actually tell us a lot about how a shark behaves, uh, what it eats, and where it lives in the wild. So, like Jillian said, we've got a little nurse shark with us today. I'm going to hold it up for you. So, if you want to look on the front of the shark, there are two little protrusions called barbels that you'll be able to see in a minute. Also, look at its mouth as I hold it up for you. We'll wait until it kind of swims over here, and I'll lift it up for you. All right. So, like I said before, we've got these two little protrusions. Those are called barbels. And if you look closely at the mouth, you'll notice it doesn't really have a lot of sharp, pointy teeth like you kind of think of when you think of a shark. So that actually can tell us a lot about how the nurse shark, what it eats. Um, so the barbels actually are kind of like little tasters that the nurse shark uses in the water to detect its food. And rather than sharp, pointy teeth to kind of eat fish and chew on something like that, it'll actually crush up its food using grinding plates. So nurse sharks actually eat things called crustaceans, which are like conch or lobster or crab, and they'll crush up the shells of that, and that's how it eats. And it'll suck up those crustaceans from the bottom of the ocean, and then chomp them up, and that's how it gets its food. I'll lift up the shark again and show you its eyes, which are another thing that it does have but doesn't use as much, and then also their ampullae of Lorenzini. So all sharks have these ampullae of Lorenzini, which um, detect electromagnetic sensors, which we as humans don't have. So they're little kind of speckles, if you can see them. And then you can see the eyes here, and they're kind of wide set. So again, that tells us about how the shark lives its life. So near sharks tend to feed at night, meaning they're nocturnal feeders. So they don't really need their eyes so much to use for hunting. They actually do use those barbels like we talked about to kind of sift around the ocean. And most of the day, they actually just kind of hang out and take a nap. Um, but they also do use those ampullae of worms. You need to, again, help them find food. Um, especially when they're kind of in the sand, it might get kind of murky and have a lot of sediment around, so that will help them to find their food. All right, so next we're going to talk about the fins of the shark, which help it move and help it um, find food, like we said. So as you can see, right up here, we've got the pectoral fins, so they're kind of out like that on the side. Um, next, you'll see the first dorsal fin and the second dorsal fin of the shark. Right behind the pectoral fins, which are kind of up front, we'll hold it still a little bit so you can see. We've got the pectoral fins. These here are the pelvic fins. And then you can see here we've got the anal fin. And then this last fin is a caudal fin. So most sharks have a forked caudal fin, kind of like that, right? So they've got an upper lobe and a lower lobe, which is called heterocircle. Nurse sharks, however, they don't move around a lot. They're not super fast swimmers, so they don't really need a forked tail. So instead, they just have the single upper caudal fin. And by looking at the shark, we can kind of see that it does tend to hang out on the bottom. So that lower fin would actually maybe get in the way of it sitting on the bottom of the ocean. So it doesn't have one. Next, like we looked at when we were looking at the head, you can see it's got a really flat head. Um, and its mouth is on the bottom, on the ventral side rather than kind of in the front like you think of most sharks. Again, that kind of tells us that it's a benthic organism or that it lives on the bottom of the ocean. Your sharks um, like to, like I said, they kind of nap all day, right? So you would think they need to stay safe, right, from predators. So nurse sharks actually live underneath ledges. So they're kind of like little caves in the ocean. Um, and that is where nurse sharks hang out. And so they'll use their flat head to kind of stick underneath the ledge and they'll hang out there during the day, and then at night they'll go out and kind of find things to eat. Um, but ledges are full of rocks, you know, they might be kind of sharp. So the nurse shark needs to protect itself somehow, right? So sharks, including the nurse shark, have adaptations to have really thick skin. The nurse shark has um, kind of an almost armor-like skin that will help it from getting scratched when going underneath ledges. Um, so when you touch a shark, 
if you feel it one way, it'll feel really smooth. And then if you feel it the other way, it'll feel kind of rough. So I'll kind of show you what that means. So if you go from the snap to the, te uh, to the tail, it'll feel quite smooth. But then if you start going this way, it feels kind of rough like sandpaper almost. So that is an adaptation that sharks have called dermal denticles, which translates dermal, like dermis, your skin, and then denticles, dent, like your teeth. So it's skin teeth. And sharks have that. It helps to reduce drag in the water and helps them become more streamlined in the water. The last thing we'll talk about are how a shark breathes, right? So sharks, unlike us, don't have lungs. They use gills to breathe. And as you can see, on the nurse shark, it's got five gills. So one, two, three, four, and five. And those are its lungs that it uses to breathe in the water, right? And nurse sharks, like when you think of some sharks, they have to you know, they have to be swimming all the time to breathe, right? But actually, nurse sharks can sit on the bottom, as we talked about earlier during the daytime. And they do this thing called buccal pumping, which is sucking water over their gills. So rather than having to swim through the water, they can just hang out and buccal pump, and that's how they get their breathing. And that's the shark anatomy, the nurse shark. <laughs> Oh, right. So scientists all around the world use a lot of different technology, um, different special equipment design for studying sharks. So it really depends on the questions that are being asked. Because you think about scientists, that's what they're asking questions. Um, and depending on the species, the location, what are the questions? They might be, what habitat does it use? What food does it eat? Um, where does it go? And these are all things to help us learn more about the animal, um, which can help us kind of understand what we need to do to protect that specific species um, or protect a specific habitat that it's using. Now, every shark that's caught here gets what's called a pit tag. And pit tags are really, really tiny. Um, you guys, if anyone has a dog or cat at home that <coughs> might grow chicken, Oh, is this just famous? Yes, we're here. All right, welcome. Thank you. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and meet you guys. Now let's see. There we go. All right. So if you can see how tiny this little chip is, all right, it's like a grain of rice. And that gets injected with a syringe, just like if you guys have had a shot at the doctor's office, it gets injected just under that dorsal fin of the shark. Um, so when the team catches a shark, they're actually going to scan for that um, with a special scanner. It's the same thing. Your dog or cat, if they have it, it's between their shoulder blades. Um, and the Humane Society or the vet can put it in, and they'll have a scanner just like this. And they'll push a button, and you'll see this when we do the workup, and we'll see if our shark has a tag in it. Push a button, swipe this over the dorsal fin. If it beeps with a number, um, it'll show up. There's actually waterproof ones of these as well, so if the shark's swimming by, you can actually get it while it's going by. So you don't even have to catch it to see if it's already been tagged. Um, so you can think of those. They last for anywhere from about 10 to 20 years inside the shark, and it's sort of like a barcode or a name tag. That's what these tags are for, is to help us identify each specific animal, because the lab catches hundreds and hundreds of sharks every year, and think of scientists all over the world catching all of these sharks. They can't remember them. Um, so it's a really to make sure we know which animals we've caught. Also, say somebody catches this nurse shark and it's gone to Florida, all right? That's about as far as they really um, go, but most of them are going to stay right around here in Bimini. Um, they can scan it and say, oh, wow, we caught this shark, and they remeasure it, or they can let people know that they caught that shark. So it's a, a tool for scientists to work together as well, uh, again, to learn a bit more about these animals. Now, another tag that's Pretty basic, pretty inexpensive um, is a Casey tag or a dart tag. You can see it kind of looks like a dart, and this goes just below the dorsal fin, so the paper comes off. We don't leave that on the shark, but it's got a number. And inside there is information that if somebody caught the shark, they can record that number, they can remeasure it, they can also call. Um, this is a NOAA tag, so the data actually goes into a, a large data pool from scientists all over. Um, and one of the things, too, is if a fisherman catches a shark with one of these on it, we hope that it I mean they'll try and let it go because they know it's part of a scientific study. Um, but ultimately, we have to catch the shark again or see it again to learn something from this data. Did it grow? Is it in a new area? 
Now, as technology is changing, think about a phone. Phones don't just make phone calls. They surf the internet, they watch videos, um, you can make videos, you can do all these cool photo edits, play games. There's a lot of stuff that um, phones can do now. And with that technology, we're able to study sharks in new ways. And one of those things uh, is a tag like this. It's called an acoustic tag. And it's called that because it makes a noise. And it can be attached on the outside of a shark or inside the shark. So if you flip a shark over, it goes into what we call tonic immobility. It's kind of a sleep-like state. And right kind of here in their body cavity, we can actually make an incision and slide this tag in, stitch it up, flip the shark over, off it goes. Didn't feel it, doesn't know what happened. Um, and this tag is going to make a noise. They each sort of have their own unique ringtone. And the shark doesn't hear it, so it's not like constantly hearing this beat. Um, but special receivers can hear it. And those receivers are placed underwater all around the island, up the coast of Florida, and different research sites. And anytime an animal, could be a shark, a tuna, uh, a turtle, swims by with one of these tags, the receiver is going to record the time of day, the water temperature, the date, and the animal. And these tags are how scientists have learned about sort of behaviors, which animals are staying in a certain area, uh, which ones show up for lunchtime every day at the same time, and some of them have best buddies that they hang out with. All right, so these tags um, have actually given us a lot of insight into the world of these animals, their movements, their behaviors, um, and their social lives. Because right? you might not think sharks have friends. Some of them do. And the last tag is pretty amazing technology. Um, it's got a special paint on it so algae won't grow on it. But inside here, there's actually a computer and batteries. This goes on the dorsal fin of the shark. And it has to go on a really big shark, a big tiger shark um, here at the lab, or magos or great whites. And it has to go on something that's dorsal fin is going to stick up out of the water. They spend time at the surface. And when this little sensor touches the air, it transmits a GPS location to a satellite. So what that means is if you think about a phone, you get directions or shows you on a map where you are. It's kind of like putting an iPhone on a shark. Right? And it's letting us know where they are and where they're going. Because we can't follow them on a boat, especially if a tiger shark's traveling thousands of miles. Uh, we certainly can't swim after them. So this really helps us understand where are they going, when are they going there, and then we can look at the why. Right? Are they moving because they're following food, changing water temperature, going to breed, or going to give birth? Right? So learning a lot more about these animals. Um, and those tags can stay on from anywhere from about 18 months uh, to four or five years, depending on the animal. And really all of it is because we want to protect sharks, so we need to know about them. We need to know about their behaviors, their diet, where are they going, what are they doing, um, ultimately to get better protection put in place. Here in the Bahamas, we are a shark sanctuary, so it's illegal to catch and kill sharks. Um, so they're safe here, but sharks don't always stay here. And they don't know whether they're in a safe zone or not. They move around. So if we can figure out where some of them are going from here, they're all going to a specific spot, say in Florida, then maybe we can get that area protected. Um, because about 100 million sharks are killed each year, and if we want to change that number or keep that number from getting bigger, we have to have data or information. So the next step is the scientific workup. The shark is caught. Now, what do we want to know about them as part of our data to be able to then think about how we're going to protect them? So now we're going to look at the scientific workup, collect some data from this little shark. Cool. Hey, guys. I'm Sarah, and I'm going to walk you through your workup, and she's is going to help me out. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll get this measuring trough. Um, this thing is really cool. It's designed to hold the little sharks, and it actually has a measuring tape in the bottom of it. So we can just set the shark in there, and we can measure the different lengths of the shark just in here, so we're not having to mess with the measuring tape. So Chessie's going to fill it up with water, and once it's filled up with water, she will grab the shark and set it into the trough so that it can still breathe while we do our work up. It doesn't really take very long. Um, the first thing that we'll do when we have the shark is we'll try to... <laughs> We're going to splash. Hang on, guys. Sorry. I'm just getting the water off the camera. All right. All 
All right, in the splash zone. In the splash zone, first 15 rows. <laughs> <laughs> so what we'll do, um, now it should be pretty stable, <laughs> um, is we'll set the shark in and see if it has that pit tag. Um, everything that we record from the shark, we put into our notebook. Um, so the first thing that we do is we need to figure out what shark it is. So if it's already ours, we'll turn on the pit tag reader, give a little beep, and right underneath this first dorsal, it should have the tag. Okay. There we go. All right. So if you can see, we have him. So he's already been tagged before, which is really cool. So now I can kind of compare the data. So he's what we would call a recapture. Um, but if he was a new capture, then we would put the new pit tag in just right here underneath that first dorsal, just in that first layer of skin. Um, and then what we're going to do is take measurements. So what we'll do is we start with the pre-caudal notch. So that is just right before every shark has just this little tiny notch right before the, their caudal tail. Um, and so we'll go whoop. And it's about 44 centimeters where that pre notch is. Other sharks have a forked tail, and that's where we'll take the fork length. But nurse sharks don't have that, so then we just skip straight to total length, which is about 60.5 centimeters. Okay? So next what we'll do is we'll measure the girth. So we'll measure how big around it is. First, we'll start off underneath the pectoral fins, and they've kind of got these little armpits, and we'll just wedge the measuring tape up, go around, pinch it, and pull it out so that we're not too close to the shark's head the whole time. And it's about 21.2 centimeters. Okay. Then what we'll do is we'll do underneath their first dorsal fin. Uh, same thing, it's got a little gap and keep going, and pinch, it's about 12 centimeters, and then their pre caudal notch again, which is very small, and it's about seven centimeters, okay? So, once we have all of the measurements, length and girth, then we'll go on to um, a fin clip. So we do that from their first dorsal fin, and we'll use these scissors, and it's just kind of like, trimming your fingernails or your toenails, we'll just take a small little triangle out of their first dorsal, kind of like that. Just a little boop boop. And um, that can give us different information about the shark. Uh, we'll take DNA, which can kind of tell us the makeup of the shark. Uh, we'll also get isotope. We can also do an isotope analysis, which tells us the diet of the shark and can kind of help us create sort of food web of the shark in the Bahamas, which is really cool. Um, another thing that we'll do during our workup is we'll take a little muscle sample. So we'll usually do that just underneath the first dorsal fin as well, but we'll do it on the other side um, where the pit tag is not located, uh, just because we don't want to get the pit tag and ruin that. Um, it's just a little scoop, and it doesn't hurt the shark, and that can also help us um, figure out its diet in just a different time frame. Another thing for diet is we'll take a blood sample. So kind of like you would take blood at the doctor's office or something like that. You take that right underneath that pre notch that we talked about, and that's where we'll draw the blood from, which can kind of give us a shorter time frame of what it's been eating, so what it has been eating recently. Yeah. And then sometimes with the smaller sharks, we'll also weigh them. And then with the bigger sharks, um, sometimes we'll put like the Casey tag or another tag, depending on the research that needs to be done. And yeah, that's how we do a scientific workup. Right. I may have to move to different questions. Perfect. Oh. Right. So, um, and when the sharks are out, uh, this little shark is quite small, so it's easy to handle and have in a tub and be able to, to work here with the shark. But um, when the team goes out and catches them, 
Uh, they're going to work the animal up right next to the boat. Um, so everything from start to finish, from the equipment that's used um, to the methods, it's kind of like everyone practice. So the team is really efficient, can do it very quickly, get all the data, make sure they don't miss anything, and then let the shark go. So don't want to keep the shark for too long. Um, if it's an, a shark that has to swim to breathe, then the boat can be kind of left in here and let them move forward a bit so that the water is passing over the gills. Um, sometimes you may see people actually use pipe like a pump and pump the water in for them to make sure that they're breathing in. Um, it's not, it's kind of the least stressful situation that we can make it because we can't explain to the animal what we're doing, but we want to collect that data. So ultimately, we can work on um, knowing more and, and protecting these animals. All right, so we're going to go to each class now. Um, we'll start with two questions. Um, so when we say your class, if you just want to um, go ahead and unmute your microphone, ask us uh, the questions, and then we'll have you muted again, and we'll go on to the next class. So let's start with um, Miss Davis's class. I think they've joined us. If you have a couple of questions for us about sharks or working with them. I mute my microphone. Hi, guys. Wave at them. Just let them know. Okay, can you hear us now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start with a question, and we do have some great shark questions, but first of all, it's, it's more a comment than a question. We just want you to know how grateful we are for the time and um, the sharing of all of your amazing talents. And you're inviting us and you're giving time because this doesn't cost us anything. And I try to keep trying to tell the kids that it costs a lot of money to run um, the um, Sharks for Kids. So we're wondering, what can we do to help support you? We don't have thousands of dollars that we could donate, but is there something that we could do as a classroom to help you? Yeah, well, we can send you guys if you have information. But one of the biggest things is you're doing right now is, is learning about sharks um, and sharing that with your friends. Because chances are a lot of your friends, even your parents, might be really afraid of sharks. Or they might think that they're the monster, these killer, uh, you know, monsters. And we hear that a lot. So you guys are all learning about sharks. Go home, share the facts, um, quit your parents. That's really a big thing that you can do is spread the word. These animals are not monsters. They're really fascinating. And they're absolutely critical for healthy oceans. And that affects all of us. Um, so that's yeah. a thing. Um, we can send you some links at the end as well from the website about ways to, to support because it's, it's not about money. I always think that's money, uh, of course, different things, but there's a lot of things that everybody can do that really can support um, conservation and science. So we can send you some links as well. But really, just you guys, thank you for joining us because that's a big part of it. Okay, we do have some questions, so I'll let one of my students ask, and then what, Lily? Um, nice and loud. How right. many teeth do a full-grown shark have? Great question. Well, it really depends. They have a lot of teeth um, throughout their lifespan. So kind of unlike us, we have hands, we have feet. So we want to go see what's in the touch it, right? Oh, I can't do that. It doesn't have hands. It only has its mouth. It only has it means it loses quite a lot of teeth in its lifetime. Um, and that's because, you know, it bites something, it might not get okay, loose. But it actually always is constantly replacing those teeth that it might lose throughout its lifetime. So it has thousands and thousands of teeth. And we've got a jaw here. Can you see that? You guys can see all those teeth. Can you see there's a number of different rows? So what happens is the shark has its set of teeth. And then when it loses a couple, it gets replaced by one of the teeth in the rows behind. So it's constantly kind of replacing any loose teeth it might have. And so it means it's got thousands of teeth over its lifetime, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. Pretty cool, right? Lots of teeth. Great question. Do you guys have another one? Does anybody else have one? Um, stand up, Patrick, nice and low. <clears throat> When was the most recent time you've caught a shark? I think the most recent shark we caught was this little guy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. Um, what we're talking about, we only keep sharks for about 30 days or less. 
So we're constantly going out to catch new little sharks. We don't catch any of the big ones and keep them in our pen. Um, we catch only the little ones. So we go out and catch the juvenile nurse sharks and then also juvenile lemon sharks, which the lab is really famous for. Um, we go out a lot. We're going out later today, as a matter of fact. So kind of a lot we go out and catch new sharks. But this is the most recent shark that we've caught here. Awesome. All right, great questions to start us off. All right, let's do um, Miss Silver's class. Do you guys have a couple questions for us? Now, now, if you can still hear us, Ms. Silver, if you want to just go ahead and unmute your microphone um, if you have a question, or uh, you can also type it in the chat box on the side. No, 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 don't do that. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so, uh, have you ever been uh, in danger because of your job in danger? Have you ever been injured because of your job? Could you say it again, please? Uh, have you ever been in danger because of your job? Oh, danger. Danger. No. Oh, no. No. And, and like we talk about, everyone trains and works with how to safely handle the animals. One, so that we don't get hurt, and also so we don't hurt the animal. Um, you might not think of sharks as being vulnerable, um, but when they're small as well, they're undersized. I think they've got organs, and, and you wouldn't grab a kitten or a puppy really hard, right? You'd be really gentle with them. So you actually have to be quite gentle with the little sharks as well. Um, so it's as much about um, keeping ourselves safe. Uh, so everything we do to working with the animals, diving with them, um, we've done a lot to make sure that we're safe, but also um, we're not hurting the animal. We're respecting them. They are wild animals, and we're always very respectful of that. Collect the data, um, you know, make it as easy on the animal as possible, let them go. Um, so everything involved um, is going to be okay. Our first priority is always the health of that animal. So even when we're working up the big sharks off the side of the boat, we like to do it as quick as possible so everyone knows their job. And it does mean that things are done so safely because we all know what our job is. We go straight in and do our job and get it down and get that shark as quickly as possible. Great question. Great question. Do you have another one? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, do you believe that the humans are dangerous uh, for some sharks uh, species? Yeah, humans are the biggest threat to sharks, ultimately. Yes. Um, all over the world, uh, you know, humans are targeting sharks for lots of products from their fins to the oil from their liver, their meat, but also just killing sharks out of fear and misunderstanding. Um, this idea that they're monsters or they're dangerous. So um, humans and our pollution, our plastic, uh, are ultimately the biggest threats, not only for sharks, but marine life in general. Um, we're definitely uh, their biggest problem, their biggest predator, their biggest threat. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. So we're going to go to Mrs. Garlock's grade four. Hi. Hi. Can you hear us? Hi, thank you so much for having us. Um, we have to run, it's our lunchtime now, but we did have one question that we wanted to quickly ask and we're so excited that you were able to come into our classroom today. Um, Ron, you wanna go ahead? How many sharks are in the world? How many sharks in the world? That's a great question. It's actually really hard to know. It's really because the populations of some of these species and are under threat and uh, and therefore we don't actually know how many of them are there. There are some species of sharks that live really deep in the ocean, so it's really hard to get a good estimate of how many sharks there are in the world. As Julian said, humans are one of the biggest influences in um, how many sharks there are in the world. And we often are getting killed um, every year and a lot of those populations are super vulnerable. So we have to do it every Great. Do you guys have time for we can do one more if you have another quick one. Why is a hammerhead um, head shaped like a hammer? So um, it's really all about sensory systems. That animal evolved, it's like a super shark. Uh, that head, which is called a cephalocoil, is filled with all these little ampullae. I was talking about earlier with the, the anatomy. 
and they can detect electrical pulses, so things like stingrays, they bury themselves in the sand, and the shark can feel that, that heartbeat coming from the stingray, kind of like a metal detector, right? The wide set eyes actually make their vision better, um, so they're kind of like this superpower sensor. So it's really um, increasing their sensory systems for finding food by having that large shaped head. They can also use it as a tool to pin down the stingrays, uh, making it easy to get much. Great questions. And I believe was your teacher, uh, this is Garland, were you a volunteer here? I was, yeah. Hey, <laughs> yeah. about that. Awesome. Well, we're so excited that we can um, connect again. So thank you so much for sharing this with your class. And, and you guys have a great lunch. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so it's a slide. Great, two, three. You have a couple questions for us. Hi, yes, can you hear us? Yeah. yeah. Hey, thank you so much for allowing us to participate in this today. It's been really, really awesome. We are having a hard time hearing you guys. What's the most challenging shark to catch? Most challenging shark to catch? Actually, he's Mershaw. I thought it would be the most challenging shark to catch. And that's the food perspective. sharks we learn where we are able to hold them for the juvenile sharks and we're taught about how flexible they are because as Jesse just said nurse sharks can bite their own tail and so can the juvenile lemon sharks so we really have to be watching them communicating with our fellow um, volunteers whenever we're doing the workups and just be really clear when you're holding on to the shark you can tell when it's tensing or if it's kind of um, about to move around so um, if you're the person holding the shark, you have such a big responsibility to let the other people around you know um, that the shark is tensing and that that's a sign for all the other people around to step back, hold their hands away so that um, we can all be safe during a workup. Um, yeah, anything else? We take a lot of classes too to learn the protocol of this lab. Um, other research places do things a little bit different than we do, but we like to keep it all the same, standardized, like we were talking about with measurements. Um, so yeah, we learn all those protocols when you get here before you go out and do any of the handling yourself. Yeah, great question. Really um, cool. Right, so this is Harmon's class. Um, do you have a couple of questions for us? Ooh. All right, Summer, can you ask me a question? How much sharks do you have? One more time. Say it again, Summer. How much sharks do you have? Uh, how, do many you, uh, how many sharks? How many sharks do you have? Yeah. So yes, yeah. Right now in the pen, we actually just have this one nurse shark. Um, like we said, we're going to go out today and try to get some more. Um, so it's we've got a couple more sharks to work with. Um, but in our database, we've caught almost over seven thousand sharks since the lab opened. Um, we don't have them all in the pen with us, obviously. 7,000 sharks is a ton of sharks to have in our little pen and back. Um, but we've caught over 7,000 here at the lab. But we usually don't leave one in the pen in the back. Um, usually, like, no 
no more than five or six. Five or six. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Come on. Stand up here. Talk in the microphone. How much sharks? What do the sharks look like? They showed you. Ask another question. You saw the nurse shark, but sharks come in a lot of different sizes. Do they live alone, or do they live with a family? Oh, what was that? Do the sharks live alone in the wild, or they live with their family? He said. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. So it depends on the species of shark. So some sharks are solitary, and they and they don't spend any time with each other. There are some sharks that have best friends. So the lemon shark, the juvenile lemon shark, we talk about that we sometimes keep in our back pen. We find them actually out in the mangroves, hanging out with other sharks of similar size. And they even have best friends within that group out there. So some sharks like to hang out with others, and while some are completely on their own throughout their life. Great question. I just want to do one more, and then we'll go back through and let the other classes do one more as well before we move up. So if you have one more question for us, they asked something that we don't already know. Go ahead. Did you name that shark? Did you name that shark? And um, we don't. We sometimes name some of our species of shark, but the nurse sharks we don't name them because they have that moving tag number. But we also get great hammerhead sharks in Binnelli, and they are a really amazing species of shark. And Binnelli is the only place um, in the world we. Winter with almost a hundred percent of them. Those sharks are named after Greek gods and goddesses. Some of them are called Medusa, if anyone knows the Greek mythology. The Medusa and Nemesis have very, very fancy names. But the nurse sharks um, don't um, have any names. <laughs> Question. All right, thank you guys. We're going to go back to Miss Silver's class if you have one more question for us. Uh, the students left. Oh, no. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Joining us. That's I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. All right. We will add uh, uh, Mrs. Sly, you have one last question for us. like they've frozen. Right, well, I guess we're gonna finish with Miss um, Davis, if you have one more question to finish us off. You had a different question, or just, what's your, no. yeah, go ahead. Okay. Nice and loud. How many sharks are born at a time? It really depends on the shark. Um, you probably heard us say a lot, it depends on the shark. That's because there's over 500 different sharks. There's so um, it really depends. Some of them give birth to live babies. The little lemon sharks we have here actually have little belly buttons from the normal cords. You probably didn't think of a shark with a belly button. Um, some of them have that. Others, like the nurse shark, are in an egg case inside their mother. They hatch from the egg case and then they're born alive and then other sharks actually just lay eggs it's kind of like a chicken egg out they don't have a nest or sit on it they leave them um uh female sharks do not take care of their baby parents they're not around um so it really depends up to one to over a hundred depending on the type of shark um, oh, wow. that's really interesting but it's not even the most still not a lot they don't have thousands and thousands of babies like this. um even though they are a type of fish uh, their reproduction is very different. They don't lay thousands and thousands of eggs. Great question to finish us off. Thank you to all the classrooms, you guys, for joining us today and anyone that watched live. Um, we appreciate it. If you want to learn a little bit more about the research the lab is doing, ways to get involved, um, volunteering when you're a little bit older or coming for a, a tour if you're visiting the island, you can check out www.bimini-sharklab.com. Um, and if you want to check out some of our other activities or lesson plans through Sharks for Kids, you can check out www.sharksforkids.com. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you guys. Bye. 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 Bye.